Hello everyone, my name is Karen Austrian. I'm an associate at the Population Council's Nairobi office in the Poverty, Gender and Youth program and I'm going to take you through a session today called Charting Success or so thinking about how do we how do we define what success looks like for the girls that are participating in our programs um, and how do we measure it and how do we um, give ourselves the kinds of tools that we need in or order to be able to track that success. Some people call this process m and &E or monitoring and evaluation, but I like to start off by calling it charting success because people are sometimes turned off by the idea of m and &E. It's too technical, it's boring, it's scary, I can't do it, I don't understand numbers very well. But it's a process that's very important to understanding what our programs are doing, um, who the girls are that are participating, and what is happening to those girls that are in our program. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about monitoring and then about evaluation. And um, we'll have some times where I'm going to ask you to pause the video so that you can um, discuss in small groups or work on some handouts. So if you don't already have all the handouts, please uh, pause and make sure that you have them in front of you. So first, talking about monitoring. I'm talk a little bit about why we monitor, and then some tools, an intake register for to document program activities, and then um, a little bit more back about why we're doing the monitoring. So. Um, first of all, this keeps track of two major things going on, proper monitoring. It takes, um, it keeps track of your program activities, what you're doing, um, and the participants are. So are we doing what we said we would be doing? We often say our girls meet twice a week, they meet once a week. We have community meetings once a month. We have parents meetings every other month. But if we don't document those things, then we don't know, it sounds simple, but that there is actually no proof that you've been doing um, these kinds of activities. The other piece that's really important is to monitor the participants and who's who's coming and how often they're coming. So we often talk about um, our program is for girls 10 to 19, but if you don't keep track regularly of who's coming, maybe it's only the younger girls who are coming, maybe it's only the older girls who are coming, maybe all the girls who are, have children have dropped out. So it's really important to do um, good and careful monitoring so that you can answer the questions, who are we reaching real, in reality, not just on paper, um, and what are we doing with those girls that are coming? And for example, I can give you an, um, an example of a program that I used to work for. Uh, we were working in one slum area that had 12 sort of subdivisions or villages, and we said, you know, we work in all 12 um, villages in this one particular slum, and because we had recruited girls from all 12 villages. So there were, on our attendance registers, there were girls from all 12 villages. But when we actually stopped to look six months down the line, we saw that girls from half of the villages weren't coming. So, you know, sort of it was false advertising when we were saying that we were reaching girls from every single village in the slum, when in reality we were only reaching half. And both it's about sort of reporting accurately, accurately, but it's a program quality tool. So if we know that girls aren't coming from a certain area or from a certain age or from a certain sort of segment of vulnerability, you as program staff have the ability to retool a little bit to say, okay, why aren't they coming? What can we do differently? Um, and to fix that. So it's both about being accountable for um, what you're doing, but also being able to have the data that you need to improve the quality of your program as it's going on. So one um, easy tool to keep track of your participants is the intake register. And here's just um, an example, and you can download an example of this, and you can fill it in with girls. But it, this, for this particular program, they're capturing the name of the girls, the age, the village um, that she lives in, what school she goes to, what class or what grade level she's in, who she lives with, does she have a child, is she married? Um, and how do they get recruited into the program. So these might not be the right categories for your specific program, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this is a one-page tool per group that you can use um, 
just with some simple modifications to make it more customized. So these are not um, very complicated tools. So another tool is to document program activities. And um, here's another example of what that tool could look like. Again, you're going to need to customize these tools. These are just examples to get you thinking. But um, keeping track, so you're on the one hand, you're keeping track of the girls that attended, but you also want to know what happened, what topics did they talk about. Um, so this is just basically has the date, the number of the girls that attended, the topics, and what activity was done. So was it um, a lecture? Was it a field trip somewhere? Was it, did you guys do role play? This could be a way to keep track to make sure they're not doing the same thing week after week after week. Um, some people want, some organizations like to consolidate their attendance registers and their activity registers. Um, another column that might be really helpful to add is any challenges that came up, any issues that need follow-up, maybe um, there was a question that came up in the group that the mentor couldn't answer, or um, for some reason there was really low attendance, and you might want to write that in the challenges, um, and that way you're documenting, and that the program staff who are supervising the group mentors can go back and make sure that follow-up is done to address those actual those challenges. Um, so I just, uh, you know, a couple more things. One. Um, Monitoring is really an ongoing process. It's something that needs to be done on a as frequently as your program is taking place. So if you if your program engages girls on a daily basis, you need to do monitoring on a daily basis. If you have activities on a weekly basis, it's on a weekly basis. Um, and the other thing is that also don't just collect that and then you walk into your office and there's a pile this high of attendance registers. But push yourself to do the analysis. Push yourself to really look at those registers, count how many girls are coming, look at to see who, which girls are not coming, um, make sure that the mentors are doing topics that they're supposed to be doing or that the challenges are being solved because if you're not going to do anything with the registers then there's really no point in collecting that data. So do not let it pile up until your quarterly report for your donor or even worse your annual report for your donor so you have all these monitoring forms and you haven't used them for a full year. And then also, as you're finalizing the tools that you want to use for your own program, thinking, think about for who you're doing the monitoring. So I mentioned two sort of audiences for the monitoring. One is for yourselves as a program quality tool, right? So what are the things you need to know that will help you make corrections along the way of your program? Another common one is your donor, right? So um, look ahead to see what your donor reports are need to our needs are going to be and make sure you're collecting that information so that you can report back to them accurate information. But maybe there are other audiences that you have. Um, maybe you report back to the community and there are in community forums and there are certain things that are really important. Maybe you report to a health facility or a part of a research study, but think about who those audiences are that are going to want to know um, who's coming to your programs and what kind of activities, um, and then make sure that you're collecting all of the information. So um, now I want you to, after I finish giving you instructions, push pause. If you're all from the same organization, you can work in sort of groups of three or four. If you guys are from different organizations, work together in organization teams. And I want you to do two things. So first, thinking, think about making a monitoring register. So um, what are the characteristics of the girls in your program that you want to capture about the girls? In terms of your intake register, that what do you want to know about them? So for example, if you're doing a program for married girls, you don't need to ask if they're married or not married, but you might want to know how many children they have. If you're doing a school-based school program, you don't need to ask are they in school or out of school? You might want to just ask um, what school, what grade level they're at, um, or things like that. So again, it's about thinking about audience, but make a list of what are the pieces of information about the girls upon intake that you want to capture for them. Um, 
And then the second thing is about an activity register. So think about um, what are the different kinds of activities um, that you do in your program and that what are the pieces of information that you need to collect each time that an activity happens. So basically, what do the titles of those columns on your activity register and on your intake register need to be? So push pause, give yourselves about 10 to 15 minutes um, to work, and then uh, give yourselves about another 10 to 15 minutes in group discussion to share with each other and really think about um, are these the headings that we want are in our columns. Is this the information that we want to capture about the girls in our program um, and about the activities that we're running? And just I'll leave you before you uh, push pause and make me stop talking that um, don't get carried away. So this is, I think, is an instance in which less is more, where you don't want to collect 25 different pieces of information if you really only need to know eight. So push yourselves to, you know, get it all out there and then sort of narrow down a little bit which ones are the most critical. So um, push pause and I will see you again in about 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, so I hope that you had fruitful small group work and a good discussion about um, what kinds of information you want to collect when you're doing your monitoring. Um, you can look to the additional resources to have the examples of the registers um, and more information about monitoring. But now we're going to shift and we're going to start talking about evaluation. So how do we tell the story of our success? Um, so we want to think a bit about um, evaluation as a journey. We're going, um, we're walking with these girls and we're moving forward. And the first step are the inputs, right? So these are the things that go into your program, whether they be um, financial resources or human resources. Um, but this is the first step that gets your program generated. Um, then we have activities. So what are the, um, the actual activities that are going on, the group meetings, their trainings, their community meetings. Um, and then we look at the outputs, right? So these are the number of group meetings that were held or the number of girls that were trained. Um, but this is sort of the first level, the things that have happened. Um, and a lot of programs for them, they're this is basically, um, this is what the mon where if you only do monitoring, this is where it'll get you to. It'll get you to the output level. So you'll be able to say with confidence, we reached this many number of girls, we re ha held 173 safe spaces meetings in the past month, in the past year. Um, but typically that's not enough, right? Because we wanna know what difference that's making. We wanna know, um, what's happening to the girls who attended those trainings or those safe spaces meetings. So we want to know the first level of outcomes and effects. What's the direct thing that happened to those girls? Um, and then finally, there's the impact. And so we think about outcomes and effects and impact as two levels of um, sort of two levels of success. And what I'm really going to focus on here is this, um, this idea of outcomes and effects. And I think that in order to measure in impact is typically those really um, long-term lofty goals. I find it helpful to think about sort of this journey that you're going on if we have these really long-term goals, and that's the impact. So maybe we want to reduce HIV affection in our community. We want to... Um, reduce the amount of teenage pregnancy, but there are there's a, another step along the journey that comes before we reach that impact. So something has to happen before we get to those long-term goals, and those we can think of as outcomes or effects. I want to give you an example before we, uh, and then I'll come back to this idea of sort of short-term goals and long-term goals for our, our girls. So let's say that your goal for your child was for them to be the president of the United States of America. Now, um, if that, so let's say that's your impact goal. 
You would have to wait a really long time from when your child was born to wait and see if you've met the goal, right? So they're going, they're going to go on a long journey before they become the president of the United States of America, but you want, might want some signs or some indications to know that they're on the path to success to reaching that goal. So um, first, let her, let's see what some of those steps might be in this example. So if your impact goal or your long-term goal is to become the president of the United States of America, you might want to see that they're... Um, that they have supporting and loving parents, right, in early childhood. So that would be important to them later being becoming president. Um, they want to graduate from college. If you don't graduate from university, you're probably not on the path to becoming the president of the United States of America. You want to graduate from law school, graduate school. So, to, so these are more signs. Becoming state senator, right? So becoming sort of a politician at a lower level. Um, Right, if we were meeting all these things, we're on the path. Getting then a lot of attention in the media, you are on your way, you're on your path, and then finally inauguration day, and then you know that your child has met that goal. Right, so if we had to wait for 40 or 50 years, um, and we weren't paying attention to the path, both like nobody wants to wait around 40 or 50 years to see if their program did anything, but you also, it gives you time to make corrections or you want to be able to know that sort of you're on track to success, right? So there are a lot of other things. So for example, um, you could be really good at sports, right? But that might not be relevant to becoming president of the United States or not. Um, you might be incredibly good looking. But again, that's not necessarily, um, those are characteristics that you could measure, but don't, that won't necessarily tell you whether or not they're on the path um, to becoming president of the United States. So this is just an example um, to get you thinking about that path to success and what it so what it looks like for the president if your goal is to be the president of the United States. But now let's take it back to our, our girls, right? So um, some examples of some of those long-term big um, big dream fantasy goals might be to reduce early marriage. We might want to um, lower gender-based violence that girls are experiencing. We might want to um, increase school attendance, all of these big things. But we want to know that we're, that changes are happening along the way, that these girls are on the path, right? So we're going back to this outcomes and effects. So if we want um, more girls to be to complete secondary school and that's our impact goal when we're looking at outcomes and effects then we we want to see um, maybe are they attending primary school are they completing primary school are they making the transition into secondary school um, another thing if we want to reduce teenage pregnancy you don't just go from sort of zero to reducing teenage pregnancy overnight we can think about um, all the different kinds of assets that girls need, right? So they probably need uh, better self-esteem. They need access to information about health. They need friends. They need mentors. They need self-confidence. Um, so all of these things might lead you to know they. Um, it's been shown that having access to economic assets can reduce teenage pregnancy. So all of these things that you want to be tracking that are sort of inside the girl. So what are the assets that she's needed? We've talked a lot about assets. You've heard about assets. So what are the different assets that the girls need in order to reach that big sort of impact goal, that big long-term goal? And we want to focus on measuring those um, that asset acquisition. So we want to, to know if she's getting those assets that she could be um, on the path to success. So um, again, another sort of small group activity, get back into the same groups that you were for the first one. And I want you to discuss two questions. So for your program, what's that big goal? What's that goal that is really what drives the passion in you um, to work with these girls? Like, we all have dreams for them to have better lives and to make these healthy transitions into adulthood. So what's the specific big goal that you're focusing on? Is it um, maternal mortality or teenage pregnancy or early marriage or whatnot? So what's that really big goal, your sort of 
becoming president of the United States goal? And then what are some of those short-term changes um, that need to happen first because they're, before they're gonna reach that big goal? Or you can think about what are the specific assets, whether they're social, health, or economic, that girls are gonna need to reach that big goal. So spend about 10 minutes talking about these two questions in your small groups, and then spend another you know, 10 to 15 minutes um, we're sharing back with each other and discussing um, what you came up with in your small group. So push pause and I will see you again in about 20 or 30 minutes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take you through a series of um, questions or thinking about so how do we know if these girls have gotten the, have acquired these assets so um, I'm gonna sort of give you a overview in the different asset categories of questions that you could ask or these are things at the level of the girl so things about the girl does she have them or not and these are simple questions that um, are domains or areas to think about to know um, these are things that we can track to know if a girl is on the path to success um, there is a handout that has a, an extensive list of questions that you can feel free to take, pick and choose which ones are most relevant to your um, topics, to your, sorry, to your organizations, adopt the questions so that they're culturally specific, but it's a base that you can go from. Um, so some of the basics, some of the just general socioeconomic questions, um, and these are some of the things you might have already discussed when you brainstormed for your intake register, but the age, um, ethnicity might be important, where you're working, who they live with, um, that's often a marker of vulnerability. Um, are the girls, say if they're not living with both their parents or at least one of their parents, um, are they married? Is religion important? Where you're living, do you wanna know what religion they are, where you're working? Um, things like that. Are they in school uh, or what grade level they are or what's the highest grade level? So capturing some sense of their educational status. Um, we also want, might wanna know about some critical life events. So. Um, if they have been married, how old were they when they were married? Or what's the, what, how old was their partner? So getting a sense of how much older their spouse is from them. Um, asking some questions around when they left school. Asking some questions around if they've ever had sex, uh, sexual intercourse. Um, have they ever been pregnant? Have they, do they have a child? So these are some pretty critical life events that you might actually end up um, deciding to segment along some of these. So if you're segmenting in school and out of school, or if you're segmenting between married girls or unmarried, or um, girls that have children and girls that don't, these are sort of the critical pieces of demographic or just biographical information that you might need to know about these girls. Um, so thinking about social assets. So what are the different kinds of questions you can ask People, especially about social assets, often say, oh, well, that, that's fuzzy, that's really hard to measure, it's hard to know. But I think um, we've begun to develop a set of questions that can actually concretely look at different social assets. And again, there is, you can refer to the handout for the much more specific and detailed questions, but um, how are girls using their time and then looking at how much of that time is isolated and how much of that time is with their peers? Um, do they have access to safe spaces? So are there places that they know of where they can go to spend time with other girls or uh, that's not school and that's not um, people in their family? How often they access those spaces? Um, do they belong to other groups? Do they have any role models? If they needed a place to stay uh, in case of emergency overnight, a place to sleep, do they have that? Um, do they have a safe place to sleep? Do they have someone to go to if they have um, an emergency? Do they have someone to borrow money from in case of emergency? So these are really concrete scenarios in which you're sort of assessing a girl's set of safety nets. 
Um, do they have friends? Did, um, so there's a series of questions you can ask to see their friendship networks, to assess the types of friends that they have, how many are they, how reliable are they, um, what do they talk about with their friends. Etc. Um, you also can gather questions about sort of their sense of safety. Um, are they safe in their community? Um, do they trust other people in their community? Etc. And that sort of gives you a picture of um, a girl's relationship to the community where she lives. Um, I think there's more around this sort of safety mapping and safety scan tools that go a lot more into detail on this if this is a sort of an area or a theme that you want to look into or explore in your program. Um, also looking at their experience of violence. So what's their experience of violence been? Um, did, did, is there somewhere they could go, etc. cetera. Um, Self-confidence or self-esteem I think is an uh, important domain to be able to measure and that's one of those ones that's especially people think that shy away from measuring it and they say, oh, it's a feeling we get about the girls or it's too fuzzy to measure. Um, but here's some sort of basic yes, no questions and then you can add them up and they basically get a score on sort of the self-esteem scale or it's, you can think of it like a test and then they get a score um, that's actually a number and the higher the score, the better. So um, do they feel as important as the other people in their family? Um, do they think they're inclined to fail? Do they feel worthless? Do they have hope for their future? So um, you can take a look at these and, and from there you sort of build um, a series of questions that give you a general picture of a girl's confidence. Um, also around decision making, who, um, we talk a lot about empowerment, right? And how do you measure if girls are empowered? So um, a big element of empowerment is just do they have the ability to make decisions for themselves, right? So you can ask questions to understand um, who makes decisions about different domains in their life, like whether or not they go to school, whether or not they get married, who they get married to. Um, you can ask about do they need permission um, for certain things? So do they need somebody's permission before they leave the house? Do they need permission before they spend money? Um, you can also ask questions about what they do with their money. Who decides how they're going to use their money? So a series of questions looking at sort of agency and decision making help you in numbers to understand that dimension of social assets. So talk a little bit about health assets. Um, you can ask a series of knowledge questions about HIV to assess how much they know. So do they have knowledge assets around health topics? Do they know where to go for an HIV test? Um, same thing around general reproductive health um, and STIs. There's a series of questions you can ask uh, to assess their knowledge. Then looking at beyond just knowledge but access to services. Um, do they know where they can go? Have they ever gone to those services? So their exposure to access to health services um, and that can give you a picture both of um, their knowledge and services components of health assets. So I'm thinking about economic assets. Um, thinking about sort of work seeking skills and knowledge. So things like um, if they wanted to go to do some income generation, how would they do it? Um, have they ever received any vocational training? You can also ask around questions around employment and earning. Um, how much money did they earn doing what type of work, etc. Um, and then around savings, thinking do they and financial education, do they have financial goals? Are they saving? Have they ever tried to open a banking account? But all of these, this series of questions gets at um, a girl's sort of financial literacy levels, um, and then also savings. So um, again, I sort of breeze through that, but I hope that just sort of gets your wheels turning in terms of thinking about what are the kinds of domains or the kinds of um, assets that you can ask questions about to monitor and the real work for you is to go through and think about all of the different assets and then look at these different questions but basically for every asset that you could think of there are a question or a series of questions that you can ask to, to say you know does this girl have this asset or not 
And if she has that asset, it is a sign that she's on the path to success, right? So you talked about what are those critical things that a girl will need so that she can reach that big impact goal. So you have to figure out what are, what questions can you ask um, in order to assess yes or no, do, does a girl have that, um, that set of assets that we then believe will lead her to reach this bigger sort of longer term goal. So this kind of data that we've been talking about is quantitative data. So um, it can be answered in a number, right? So she has a certain percent of the assets that we think she needs, or a scale, right? So we talked about sort of like a, a test on something. So you're measuring one concept like self-esteem with 10 questions, and then they get a score, eight out of 10, um, 10 out of 10, two out of 10, maybe when they come into your program. Or, or for example, an average. Um, the, then you can look at all the girls in our program. When they started, they got an average average score of 50 out of 100 on our knowledge uh, test on HIV, and then by the end they had an average score of 85. Um, quantitative data tends to be good for sort of description and the overall, getting a sense of the overall picture of where the girls are in your program. Um, it doesn't answer the questions about how or why, but it's, it's descriptive. Um, and typically this kind of data gets collected either in surveys or, qu or questionnaires, and it's most effective to do it before and after, right? So pre and post, you want to collect information before and after so that you can see how girls have changed over the course of your program. So um, this is not just something that you can think of at the end of your program. Oh, quick, let's put together a survey because you don't know what the girls were like at the start. So you want to plan for this and do it um, before and then after. So just a few suggestions. The top one is to keep it simple. This is not meant to be very fancy research. This is to give you the information that you need to make your programs better and to tell the stories of success for the girls in your program. Take standard questions and make them relevant to your context. Don't just copy and paste them word for word. Um, the girls might not understand them and they'll, they'll probably be missing some of the nuance. Um, like we've talked about, measure what you're trying to change. The example of playing basketball, right? You could measure do the girl do the girls play basketball or not. But if that if playing basketball is not part of your program or um, it's not what you think is sort of on the path to success, then don't measure it. You could measure if a girl sort of knows how has a vocational skill, right? Or if she knows how to be a tailor or a hairdresser or something like that. But if that's not a something that you're doing in your program, so you wouldn't expect there to be any change. So if you're not trying to help girls get vocational training, et cetera, then that's less important. And if you don't believe that those kinds of skills are on your specific path to success, then you don't need to measure it. For some programs, you really want to measure that. Maybe you're a vocational training program, or maybe you see sort of getting a productive skill is clearly on that path to success. In that case, you would want to measure that kind um, of asset. Again, think back to the intermediate steps. So we talked about sort of the outcomes and effects level, the path to success, um, and really try to measure those immediate effects. That's what you're gonna be able to see within six months or a year. Those big goals take a really long time to get to, and you wanna be able to know that the girls are on the path to success. Um, like I mentioned, evaluation is not just something that you save for the end. It's something that you do before the activities start, while they're going on, and at the end. Um, but at the same time, don't collect too much data, um, only collect it as often as you're going to do something about it. So you don't need to collect data every three months if you're really only going to assess on a yearly basis the kind of change that's going on for the girls in your program. Um, so before we end, just a bit about qualitative data. Most of what I talked about today was quantitative data. Um, but qualitative data is also a very effective tool um, and I think can be used very well in complement with quantitative data. So you can use it both 
informative um, in order to get information um, at the start of your program to help you design your program and then also to evaluate at the end. So this is also can be done before and after. And this is really the kind of data that answers the question why. Um, so if you want to get beyond just the descriptives um, of what change happened, but to really understand why did that change happen? What was it about participating in a girls group once a week that helped you to um, prevent teenage pregnancy or that helped you to feel better, have greater confidence? You know, why is, why is the change that we're seeing taking place in the quantitative data in our surveys taking place? So, the types of qualitative data can be collected through in-depth interviews, so sitting down with a girl one-on-one -on -one and just asking her questions, um, or through focus group discussions, so getting together um, a small group of girls and asking them sort of more in-depth questions. And one of the key ways to distinguish the kinds of questions that you want to ask for quantitative data, you want to be asking what's called closed questions, or questions that can be answered either with a number or with one word, right? It's yes or no, it's agree, disagree. Um, but for qualitative data, you want to ask open questions. So if the respondent or if the girl that you're talking to can answer that question that you're asking in one word or in two words, you're not asking the right kind of question to collect quantitative data. You want to ask them to describe. Um, you want to ask them to explain, to tell you more about. You don't want to ask them yes or no questions because that's not going to give you the kind of depth or richness that you want or the explanation that you want out of qualitative data. Um, so just as we close, so thinking about taking all of this information and putting together a comprehensive monitoring and evaluation plan for your specific organization or program. So just a few tips. Um, make a timeline. So like I said, this isn't just something that should be an afterthought. You should think about just the way that you make a work plan for your program activities. So in quarter one, we're going to do this. In quarter two, we're going to do that. Include the monitoring and evaluation activities into that so that it's integrated from the start. Um, also, be realistic about how long these activities take. Um, and make sure that it's allocated the time necessary in staff work plans. But again, keep it simple and short. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to collect data that you're not doing anything about. Um, and again, and we've talked about this, but just sort of to hit the point home about thinking about these intermediate results and thinking about measuring things that you really believe your program is going to change, that you're going to have a direct change on that girl herself, sort of things that are going to change within her. Um, as a direct sort of result of your program, and those are the things where you would want to see improvement. Um, so we've also provided you with sort of sample tools for developing an m and plan. You can um, download those tools, access them, work with your team to sort of come up with that plan, and then uh, put it into action and go forth and monitor and evaluate. So I want to thank you for um, listening to the presentation, uh, and feel free to go back and listen to sections to, that might be more helpful, to look at the additional resources and handouts and tools um, that can help you take this information and really customize it um, to your own organizations and your own programs. Thanks.